there, and welcome back to In the Shadows of Utopia. Uh, we have a very special bonus episode today, where we will be speaking to a very special guest, uh, and something that kind of falls out of the chronology of the series. A uh, standalone episode, if you will. I'll be talking to Dr. Tom Chandler of Monash University, where I got my undergrad degree. Uh, he's an expert in graphic design, and he's also working on a fascinating project called Visualizing Angkor. As he explains in the interview, basically this project is an attempt to sort of bring together all these kinds of evidence and historical sources, everything that's really available about Angkor, and produce a kind of virtual simulation of the city. You can actually experience some of these simulations firsthand in virtual reality, which is quite amazing. Uh, I, anyway, I'll let him explain the project more, as we, we had a really good and, and interesting conversation uh, about his journey toward the project, the interesting opportunities that this kind of simulation uh, has for historians studying this period. It's, it's a great chat. I'd encourage people to go to www virtualangkor.com for more information there as well because it's a great thing that Tom and his team are doing. I've left a link to that website on the podcast website which you can find in the description and if you ever feel like sending me an email you can do so at shadowsofutopiapodcast at gmail.com. So uh, without further preamble here is Tom Chandler. I'm sitting here with Tom Chandler, um, the first guest on In the Shadows of Utopia. And while I've given him a little introduction before the episode started, why don't you just start off, Tom, first of all, how are you today? I'm great, thanks, Lucky. Yeah, it's brilliant. good to talk to you. <laughs> brilliant. Yeah, in my studio office today. Yeah, yeah, it's really nice. I like what you've done with the place. Um, so, yeah, my name's Tom Chandler. I'm a senior lecturer at Monash University. I'm in the um, Faculty of IT, and I teach... 3D animation and um, I guess game design, um, but way back I have a undergraduate in archaeology. Brilliant. And you're working on uh, simulations of Angkor. I know that's not quite the the scope yeah. of what you're doing there, but can you briefly tell me what are you doing with what the Angkor project? Okay, yeah. So it's it's called the, yeah we call I call it the Visualizing Angkor project. I guess it's been going for about ten years. Um, I don't, you know, I don't have time to work on it every day. Um, some of those years we hadn't been able to do much, but in the last five years, it's kind of taken off again. So what we're doing, um, with this project, I, I think essentially I'm trying to find out what it is to, to put all the knowledge and things we know about a civilization into kind of a 3d form, mm. you know, like a th well, 3d models, um, to try and put as much as we can, uh, put it all together inside a computer. So it, it's, it's like a virtual anchor. Um, have we done it all? No, not by any means. We're only, I guess we're not even halfway yet. Um, but what it involves, this virtual anchor project, is it involves you know, ma making a whole lot of models of houses, of trees, of animated characters, of people, of animals, of temples. Um, and kind of positioning them and patterning them over this re really large scale map. And a lot of this um, mapping work has been done by my colleagues like Damien Evans and Christophe Potier. Mm -hmm. And these are, these are large archeological maps. So uh, we're taking little parts of those maps. Sometimes they're just a few kilometers square and we're just trying to bring in all the information we can find to make it into a virtual world where there's people walking around and there's rice fields growing and the, the temples are there as kind of uh, living focal points of the community around them. So it, it's, it's trying to reappraise Angkor as, as, a, as a living city, even if only a virtual one, and not a relic or a, a 
dead city mm. or uh, this enigmatic ruin that it is so alluring to all the tourists and people who go there. Mm. And it, yeah, it's one of the mysteries about Angkor. But what I'm really interested in is how, how virtual technologies, 3D technologies, often these are the same thing used for games and uh, high-end 3D animations for movies. We're using that kind of software, but I guess model and visualize and give this kind of form to things that until now was really only at the edge of people's imagination. Yeah. Well, before we get into the sort of the, the nitty gritty or the, the details of this like really fascinating project, and I've I've seen some of these simulations firsthand, uh, they're amazing. Thanks. Can yeah. we talk a little bit about first of all your relationship with Cambodia? Um, sure. For most people, Cambodia is sort of it's like a cheap holiday destination. Yeah. That they go yeah. to, they spend a few weeks, they have a few beers, they love it. How did your relationship with the history of this country become something that you wanted to sort of professionally pursue? Uh, when did you first travel to Cambodia? What made you fall in love with Cambodia? Sure. Um, I guess, um, I mean, I, came, I went there relatively late. Uh, I think I was, it was back in 2001. I was 29. And uh, that, was, that was the first time I visited there. Before that, I hadn't really had all that much interest in that in it and also it was quite hard to get into it was quite dangerous to go to of course. but it wasn't before that it wasn't coming up on my radar with you know where a lot of my friends have been or other travelers i met and nobody had really gone there previously and i get i should mention you know um my dad's a famous um historian of cambodia and i, I guess it's it it's kind of common to um the, the, the thing that your parents do is one of the last things you're interested in when, you, when you're young. So when, when I was um, w when I was young and studying archaeology, and I, I was much more interested in Egypt and the Middle East mm. and, and uh, you know South America. Um, I, I knew about Cambodia, but of course, again, it, it, this was you know the the early '90s, and uh, you couldn't really go there. Mm. Um, or it just was very hard to get in there, and you get reports on the news. Every now and again, you hear about people getting uh, pulled off trains and shot. Yeah, or, the Khmer Rouge. Or, yes, uh, kidnapped yeah, by the Khmer Rouge. So, that. yeah, it wasn't that high on, on my list. But okay, so getting back to the, you know, the first time I went there, I was um, after university. I, I uh, went over to the UK and then New York and back to the UK, and I was I was working as a graphic designer and then later as a kind of a web designer and then I got into 3D and that was working in advertising and, you know mm. this is the dot com boom this is kind of early days and there was a lot going on it was a very busy time but the the work it, all of that started to gradually collapse mm. and at the same time I was getting quite sick of the stuff I was doing so I said no, I, I thought look I'm going to travel back to Australia and um, then I'll see what I'll do next. I don't know what I'll do next. But I thought, I'll, I'll visit Cambodia on the way home. And uh, my dad gave me a, uh, this uh, list of people to contact there. Mm. Like about 15 or 20 people that he knew. All these phone numbers that I could kind of call up and um, see. So I had, I had some contacts there. And they were kind of a way to um, engage with the country on a, on a deeper level than most tourists did. But... So I went there in yeah 2001. It was still um, it was very different to how it is today. It was it was there wasn't many cars around. Yeah, a lot of motorbikes, still a lot of C clothes, still a lot of ox carts. Um, it was, Phnom Penh had no skyscrapers. It was a it was yeah. a very different town, very quiet town, and I ended up staying there for six or seven months. So I really just um, I got in Phnom Penh or did in you Phnom Penh. Yeah. I went up to Siem Reap. I went around to Battambang. Yep. A lot of the time in Phnom Penh, um, and you, you could um, you could kind of rent uh, one of the motorbikes quite cheaply, and just you could just go anywhere. I mean, yep. that's what I was doing. I was often just taking this. Um, pretty crummy motorbike that I was always worried it'd break down but I was I was traveling in between the towns and around long long trips on very dusty roads driving you know very slowly because I'm, I'm accident prone mm. but I survived um the, I imagine the yeah. roads wouldn't have been they're not that great in some parts of no, Cambodia today. they were terrible yeah. then yeah they were they were just they were like dunes yeah I, yeah all, even the main roads uh, if you're going on a bus or a van it was just uh is bone jarring mm. yeah so I mean, getting around was hard, but the, the people were wonderful, and I kind of 
kind of, uh, you know, very soon became fascinated with Angkor and all the, um, not just the temples around Siem Reap, but some of the, the ones you can find down in the south in Phnom Da and, you know, out to Batambang and over to Stung Treng and all those places. So I, I got around it as much as I could. I didn't see everything. I think it was five or six months I, I kind of came back to Australia and um, I didn't really know what I was doing next. So I thought I'd enroll in a master's by research I'll do something to do with animation mm -hmm. maybe 3D animation it was a, it was about a year later when I thought well I'm doing something 3D in animation I'm really fascinated with ancient cultures and, and archaeology maybe I'll do something kind of 3D visualization for archaeology and I was kind of working on that for a while and in the meantime I was going back to Cambodia and Angkor uh, every year for, for a few weeks for a month as much time as I could get um, and I met a lot of Australian archaeologists who were then students, but uh, now a lot of my colleagues who were starting to work on, um, they were working uh, with, out of Sydney University on the Greater Angkor Project. Is that where you first met Damien Evans? Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. that's it. Um, so I, it seems like it would have been obvious, but it, it wasn't obvious to me at the time. But I think it was like a couple of years where it all just clicked and thought, oh, I know what I'll do. It'll be some kind of 3D visualization of Angkor. So that's how this project yeah. sort of and started. It, it took me some years to come around to that. I yeah. mean, it was it was right in front of me, but I, I was I was pursuing all these different angles. So I enrolled in a PhD at Monash. Yeah, we I tried out various ways of what it what it is to to uh, to I guess use three D animation, use three D models mm. to try and tease out uncertainties in the archaeological record to to try and put information together. And how seeing it in a visual form um, with, you know, using many streams of information coming from historical texts and coming from, um, you know, historical accounts and um, from archaeological accounts, how, what visualization, trying to articulate what, what visualization can bring to, I guess, the, the investigation, the exploration and the, the study of Angkor. That sort of leads me to to my next question uh, what would you say the overall goals of this virtual Angkor project are sure um again it, yeah it's, it's hard to say that there are uh, really defined goals because it's kind of a, a project that rolls on and on and uh, I, you said I, you've been doing this for ten, it's, it, ten, it's about it's 10, 10 years, years yes so ten not years. every day of course just yeah. I, but I, I think I'm, I'm um if anything I'm only halfway um, I think the overall goal is to really, I guess, see see Angkor as a living city, even if it's and this this is it's a virtual one, and that, mm. that's that's a way to really to see it, to apprehend it. And this is this is very. I, I say that there's there's a lot of um, you know, archaeological and historical and indeed scientific information that goes into this, but I wouldn't say that it's a thoroughly objective project. It's it's it there's admittedly it is very subjective it's it's very bound up by the technologies of the time i think mm. you know where we can only so um when, when we say what it is to see the past where we're only seeing um a collection of of facts that we know put mm. together and packaged in a new way where it's a new way of looking at what we know about the past yeah i wouldn't ever go so far as to say i'm, I'm you know it, it's virtual time travel because the, the past is it's, as the cliche goes, it's a, it's a different country. They do yeah. things differently there, and to see Angkor as a living city is 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 really something new. And what is living, you know, in, in this sense, animation in by definition, animate uh, to animate means to to make alive. So how how things are moving, how people are moving, um, I guess looking at Angkor as a city, as a living city, you're really talking about a very green city as well. Mm. And that, that's another concept that's very interesting. Talking to colleagues, our notions of, of what a city of the past is. And I guess when we think of, you know, we, we think of cities in Greece and Rome, Egypt, um, where we're often thinking of cities that are built from stone, where the gardens and the fields are all outside the walls. Mm. So these are, they're stone cities. Uh, with a clearly delineated boundary between the, the green and the uh, either the mud brick or the stone walls and the buildings inside, Angkor is very different. It's it's like a it's like a garden city. Yeah. Um, 
And so if you kind of fly over the virtual model, um, some of it looks like a forest, but if you look closely, it's really all these deliberately planted trees around the houses that are there for shade. Yeah. And there's a whole metropolis all linked together through the paths and the roads and the canals, but it's very, very green. Yeah, it's well, not open and, um, and sparse. Yeah. That sounds very different to the traditional ideas of this city that we've been used to for, what, the better part of maybe a hundred years. Yeah. Um, it sort of leads me to my next question. It, you co-wrote an article a few years ago. I just want to read you a quote and have you sort of react to that. Sure. So you say, uh, At Angkor, where the landscape between the temples was previously rendered merely as jungle or white voids on the printed page, we can begin to address archaeological uncertainty with shifting patterns of wooden buildings, trees, settlements and village shrines. And finally, in this space of interchangeable elements, moving figures and simulated sound, we can begin to explore the wider potentials of what a historical 3D computer model might offer to scholarship in the digital age. So. What do you think the advantages are of creating these spaces for the modern historian investigating these periods? Sure. Um, and thanks thanks for rereading my... Uh, that sounds very verbose to you. Now that <laughs> that back to me. But I, 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 do, I do remember what I was trying to get out there. Um, I, look, I, I guess is, um, it, some of my colleagues have, have often, you know, in, in years past at, at uh, conferences... So one of the terms that's often introduced is the to change the, the what was previously the temple centric approach of Angkor, which means um, early scholarship and uh, especially um, the first French epigraphers and uh, uh, translators and uh, architects and historians who, and archaeologists who went in there. They're really really concerned with the temples mm. and um, what um, what they can glean from the inscriptions on the temples and how the uh, how they could clear away the vegetation from the temples and whose temples they were and how they, you know, to what, to which God and to which king the temples were dedicated or built by. This was um, all part of discovering this lost, lost that's civilization, right. yes. wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, and I think, I mean, the, the, the fascination, these, you know, the temples are, the, are, are really um, extremely important for Angkor. You, you can't deny that, and that's mm. what everyone comes to see. That's That's really... Again, what we call this religious skeleton of mm. the city. Um, so these temples, I guess, if we think of these temples, and especially thinking about village shrines, which of which there were, there's hundreds all over the uh, the Angkor Plain, and these have been revealed um, by extensive mapping by by my, my colleagues like Damien Evans and Christoph Pottier. Especially when we think about village shrines or or the temples, really, what you're looking at is these focal points for a wider community that, mm -hmm. that's what you're looking at the remnants of the, this central uh, the, the stone structures that have survived were the focal points for a much larger community that all dwelled in wooden houses, bamboo and thatch constructions and this is the perishable green living city, Angkor was a wooden city with stone temples so stone temples and brick temples these were reserved for the gods. You know, as everyone knows, even the um, even the palace the king lived in was built of wood, even though it had stone walls around it. It was a wooden palace, so everything that's that's wooden at Angkor disappears mm. and completely disappears. There's um, you're very lucky to find just small fragments or beams of wood in some of the temples. They're very very rare. Mm -hmm. They do exist, but it's it's. Nothing really preserves, none of this wood really preserves in the, in the, in the ground. So getting back to this, you know, what is it to, to visual? So if you, you have the site of a village shrine, and this might be reduced to a pile of bricks. Mm -hmm. It might have been totally pulverized by fig trees and long abandoned. You would imagine the village shrine is kind of like, if we're thinking of, you know, comparing it with medieval Europe, these village shrines are like the... The little village chapels yeah. in Europe, the as same opposed period. to like a cathedral, exactly, or, okay. or uh, the you know the uh, a quite substantial church in in a large town. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that's a good comparison with the with the um, the temples. So around the if you've got the remains of a village shrine, you've perhaps some idea of perhaps the size of the community that was around it. How mm -hmm. many you know roughly how many people it took to sustain this village shrine? 
that was the focal point of the of that community's um, religious activities for their festivals. Um, and you know this village shrine is linked to another village shrine not far away and there's a neighborhood of them and they're linked to a larger temple and that that becomes kind of this anchor point the, the little stone remains where you can start to reimagine the communities around mm. them so it's not yeah. just the this when you go to Angkor today you've got your know, Angkor Wat and then few kilometers of motor motorcycle away you've got a tar prom or yes, it, yeah Inca tom so you're you're giving us everything in between these spaces which That's for right. a long time d- did no one know what were there or the, the, the H- no hardly anyone h- hardly anyone knew about them mm-hmm. um i mean certainly some of the archaeologists knew about them but they didn't have comprehensive maps yep. of, they, they couldn't relate all these small shrines together um, until fairly recently so um, this is this is some of the work that um, the University of Sydney and the Greater Angkor project kind of revealed gradually is this huge metropolis. The, the size of Angkor was incredible. It was it's a, a mega city. Yeah, in, that's in right. Sort of modern yeah, terms. they often. I mean, it's often said that it's about the size of modern Los Angeles. Yeah, but it, it's not. It wasn't. It was the. At the at its height, it was the biggest city in the world, but it yeah. was not the densest. There were other cities in China with m- many more people in them. Okay, they were just much more compact. I see. So, but it certainly was the biggest in, in kind of aerial extent at yeah. the time. So you've got when we talk about all these village shrines, they're part of that city. Yeah, it, it's kind of it's pushing the analogy so, too far to say that they were suburbs. But um, what people when they go to Angkor, when they're visiting Angkor, they're really looking at the urban core. Mm. yeah so the, the cbd yeah you know for one of a better yeah. um comparison but and the there's skyscrapers all the, that still remain that's it thing. and okay. then then there's all the the suburbs all around that and other temples even further out so i'm getting back to addressing that that quote that you you read to me i think so you know if we, you can take this uh ruin of a village shrine and if you roughly know the date of it you could uh start to look at how you could swap in models because there's so much uncertainty when you only have a pile of bricks exactly what did the shrine look like well it could have looked like a number of designs actually Mm -hmm. but it's been well established there's kind of an um there's an art historical uh progression and kind of relationship between certain styles of architecture and art at at angkor this is um that you know this is well known so we early on we were experimenting with, with if we have a site of a village shrine where there's just a ruin there, well, it could have been a number of different designs. And we had this kind of system where you could swap in one of 20 or 30 different variations yeah, right. to take that place. Yeah. And then where did the On trees... On the fly as well. Just, you know, that's it. You re- know, they... redo your thesis yeah. there. You can just... <laughs> that's it. And, well, that's, that's one of the things about this, this virtual world. It's, kind of, it's very dynamic because there's so much uncertainty. So if you, if you just... If you have it looking just a particular way, then there's so much of it that is speculative or wrong. Mm. But you can swap in different models and rearrange models to try and tease out different hypotheses. And, yep. and really to, to sit down with scholars and kind of go through things. What if it was like this? What if it was like that? Mm. Perhaps it was like this. For instance, you've shown me... Um uh, Angkor Wat in, in different colour schemes uh, that's different right materials, yep. Yep. Different, yeah yep. it's fascinating and that that, that latest uh, model we made of Angkor Wat over the last I guess four years here, here at Monash was um, what that model would do is it, it would kind of ran through a series of different variations because all the art historians and many of the archaeologists and uh, some of the historians we talked to, there was a lot of disagreement about yeah. uh, exactly what colours it could have been or whether it was coloured at all. There, mm. was, there was a lot of um, a lot of people said they just didn't know, mm. and there was you know, particularly for things like all the vegetation when we mentioned the green city, you don't know exactly where the trees were. It's yeah. very hard to determine. You can know from archaeological pollen cores, um, which uh, have been extracted, what kind of trees were in the area from the pollen they, uh, that is left over in some of the moats or the ponds that, that they extract. Um, but you can only really, you can kind of start to put this together by looking at how 
the present day Khmer settlement patterns and settlement patterns even especially the photography from the 19th century mm -hmm. from colonial photography you can look at what kind of trees um, Cambodians had around their houses yeah and whether these trees were native to Southeast Asia some of them are brought in after the Spanish and Portuguese brought all, all these uh, fruits over from South America now they wouldn't have been at Angkor so mm. you have to have to rule those out and you have to look at what species were there how close were they to the houses and what do the houses look like well it, luckily um, I guess from the historical photography uh, from the uh, especially the colonial period the houses seemed of, of the the regular people the common people the peasants they seem to be pretty similar to the ones Charles de Guan was describing we'll get um, to Charles yep. de Guan in a minute as yep. well but um I guess you've you're filling in the gaps in between the temples of Angkor, but I should say that you can, using virtual reality technology, we can actually step into these gaps as well. We can see firsthand mm. the, the gaps in between these temples. Um, I should say that uh, due to a couple of technical mishaps and uh, some dead batteries, last time we spoke, you weren't able to give me the full VR treatment of the virtual Angkor project. But in the meantime, I've, I've actually purchased my own VR headset. I've been able to spend some time with the technology. Mm. And I've been blown away sort of to the extent that your mind allows itself to be immersed in these environments. In one game, I was thrown off of a building. And I did experience a certain degree of, of vertigo and, and sort of shock at being, you know, falling to my death. So... While I've been enjoying these um, these games and videos, I've also been able to finally check out some of the immersive 360 degree videos from the Virtual Anchor project that I, I wasn't able to see last time. They're amazing. I've, I've really enjoyed them. Uh, I've stood on the causeway uh, looking at Angkor Wat as people, uh, busy, busy little uh, animated people, uh, went about their jobs. I've sat in a marketplace. I've been to the rice paddies. I've, I've sat on a canoe going down one of the canals. For me, this is sort of a dream come true. I've, I've often loved the idea of sitting in a bubble and, and sort of traveling through the past and looking at people do these things. So thank you for that. <laughs> <Okay>. um, <laughs> now, there's a, there was a moment I looked out at this rice paddy. It was sunny. There were clouds in the distance, a, a rumble of thunder. It was, it was really quite beautiful. But what that did, uh, every time I've visited Angkor, I've been going there for the, since 2011, I've tried to build on my understanding of this city. I've tried to imagine what it was like as I walked around this, this skeleton we're talking about now. I've tried to fill in the gaps in my imagination. But it was not until last night that I, I sat in my living room with my VR headset on that I've actually been able to fully realise that goal. So... Like we've, we've, we've sort of been talking about you filling in the body around this this skeleton. Mm. And this is something I think that is missing from a lot of people's experience of traveling in this, this beautiful archaeological site today. And I think a, a big part of that, and you sort of mentioned it, is the details going into this simulation. Mm. I would love for you to, to talk to me about... Um, this attention to detail, uh, for instance, the, the sound of a woman sweeping her around yeah, her house, yeah. the, the detail of the various fruits sitting in this market. How have you and your team managed to do this? Uh, um, yeah, so that, that's, I guess, like, the answer to that is um, just time. Right? We have time yeah. on our side. <laughs> All this detail just takes time. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's hard to 3D model all these things, especially if they're animated. But there is one... There's one saving grace here in, in 3D modeling. So, for instance, a sugar palm tree, which is emblematic of, of Cambodia today mm. as it was in the past. Um, that takes a couple of days to, to model in 3D accurately. Yep. And this is using photographs of, of sugar palm trees and making sure that the 3D model's not too uh, um, uh, cl clumsy in terms of how it's constructed so that it's not... Um, so that you can make a lot of them and it doesn't take too much space. In other words, it's an efficient model. It's modeled efficiently. So it takes, as I said, a day or two to get it right. And that might seem like a long time to make just one tree, but the saving grace is once you've made it, you then have untold thousands of them yeah. if you need to. And the same goes with uh, the modeling an elephant, which is, again, another emblematic animal of Angkor. You only need to look at the bar reliefs and the sculptures. 
um, to just to know how important they were to Angkorian society. That modeling and animating an elephant, um, you know, detailing all the the um, the wrinkles in its skin, how it moves its ears, um, um, how uh, the pace of its walk as it plods down the road, uh, getting these things kind of right. That can take weeks. So you've but, built all the assets in it. There's not some stock. No, pile yeah, there's that the, you're using unfortunately not. The no, there's no way we, from Age of Empires. No, <laughs> we, there's nowhere we can really steal this stuff from. Okay. Um, and yeah, it's, it's all our own models. Now, I, again, with the elephant, it takes ages. But once you have one done, you have an elephant army if you need one. Uh, and one day we we might try that. But or it, at least you you have as many elephants as you need. So the same thing goes with the people. Um, you know, modeling a person and getting them to walk uh, hard is difficult. And then we're trying to animate some of the, the gestures, the body language, um, some of the ways that, that, that people react to each other and how, how they look distinctly Khmer. You know, these, so these small animations, these small movements, they're really important because how, how two Khmer people at Angkor might have conversed with each other when they were sitting down would be quite different from say how two people in Song Dynasty China might mm. and just just the way that they'd move their hands the, some of some of the things they do this is you know this is part of these subtleties and details that we haven't really got to yet I mean, this is something I'm really interested in mm. is you know perhaps we looking at the bar reliefs you have clues about certain gestures that people made not just how they stood but how they how they sat and you know how they reacted in groups, all these kinds of things. And so, some of these things you could you could glean from present day Cambodia. Some of them are they're they're pretty mysterious. Um, yes, and and again, yeah, the bar release. Unfortunately, a lot of the bar release they they do focus on the royal court and they focus on, on very important people. There's some there's some hints of of the everyday life of of um, just the regular people of Angkor at at the uh, Bayon, but it's not a lot to go on. The, the, uh, historical photography is also uh, really useful here. I guess um, things like photographs taken by um, the Dutch in Bali around 1900. These can be very useful as, as kind of giving some broad hints about how people would have you know congregated in markets it's not exactly like Angkor but you know given their, their dress and attire and um that the, the Hindu religion as, as a kind of a Hindu kingdom of Southeast Asia um these give us some more hints mm. about how Angkor might have looked or at least a kind of a reasonable proxy to help us kind of generalize some things yeah, yeah. it's amazing how uh close to the source you've gone to create this world i mm. I, I didn't realize it was all built by by you and your team and all modeled. I, yeah it well it is and th yeah thankfully i've got a very good team of um and without them I, I i wouldn't i don't think much of this would be done at all mm. I, they help with you know um creating some of the characters um modeling some of the environments um putting the the uh, the structure of everything into virtual reality um so and you've and, been to cambodia to to draw from these things firsthand as well haven't yes yeah, sure I, sh I should mention also yeah you, you mentioned the sounds earlier we, yeah we, we record sounds in cambodia whenever we can get them mm -hmm. I, I and even in the, my early days when i was there you just be recording frogs you'd be recording people talking you'd yeah. be recording um the sound of the wind through um the kind of pandanus hedges along the rice fields the recording the sounds of birds the recording anything you can grab from from the environment it, it's really hard now um i guess you know to to get these sounds with the, the rapid development of Cambodia, especially around Angkor, there's always planes in the sky. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, you kind of have to go further out into the country um, to, to capture this stuff. So yeah, th that's all really important. So again, yeah, all the detailing, it's also very iterative. You know, a mm -hmm. lot of the, a lot of the things we made years ago, we'll go back and fix, or, yep. you know, we'll be interviewing uh, one of my colleagues or uh, one of, uh, you know, an expert in a certain area 
might bring up something we haven't thought of before or point out something that we might have a little bit wrong. So it's, it's just slowly... Get in there yeah. and change it. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So there's yeah. a lot that's being slowly updated and changed. Well, it is amazing to be, like I said, be in there and, and see and hear these things. Sure. Uh, like with the VR headsets, it's quite amazing. But lucky if I could ask you a question there. Ooh. It was quite clear to you that it was all virtual though right i mean the, the yes. characters did look like computer characters and it yeah even though we, we try and make the models quite faithfully you're not at all fooled that it's a real world no yeah no you're not yeah. fooled into thinking you're actually there it's not, not but, photorealistic but like it some is of filling the, in yeah. these gaps of imagination that i that i brought up earlier yeah. where if you're walking around angkor today for me at least it's a struggle to to use my mind's eye to, yep. to see these things and if anything this is that the way forward i think for for doing that for a lot of people even though it is not a photorealistic simulation it still does inform your imagination of the that's past, right and you know? i mean that's yeah it's interesting it's good that you said that because i mean some people have asked me well you know can can you make can you do things even more realistically? Mm. I mean, so the, the, this is a real push in all kinds of um, simulated, you know, virtual worlds. Well, that's been so, the, since the, the trajectory of video games for the last that's it. 20 years. It's just but, been um, more polygons. That, that's it, yes. And I mean, eventually some of them might be indistinguishable from, from reality, from video, from mm. video reality. That, that's, I, I'd, like, I'd, I'd really like to give it a certain aesthetic that as soon as people are in there they they know it's a kind of, it's a computer mediated world mm. it, it looks like an engaging computer game yeah the characters are almost real and the, the landscapes are almost real but they have a consistent aesthetic so that everything looks like it in it kind of belongs in the same virtual space yeah you feel it's, like you're in a video game yeah it, that's right yeah. and I'd, I'd like to I, I one of one of the things i'd like to argue here is that i think this technology is absolutely ideal for imagining the past mm. because it's not real mm. and it's patently not real but it's it's engrossing and convincing you can keep you can suspend your disbelief like yeah. being inside a video game yeah. you know that the game's not real so this is really important that um and i think for for your generation for my generation particularly for all my students i, I don't there's there's a there's a very developed understanding about these these virtual worlds as they're essentially simulations. Everyone's aware of this. Yeah. So it, it becomes this ideal tool to try and swap in ideas and test things. And rather than contending that this is that's how it right. was, yes. this is what it looked like. Yes. You're not saying that. You're saying and that given the information that we have, yes. this is the picture that we can make. Yes, and so yeah, like an animating it, 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 history. Yes, it could of be the writing history. It could be like this. So yeah, yeah it, this is plausible given the information we, we have, um, and and yeah, this is an important distinction to make. So I think um, where where some of these visualizations of the past draw criticism is when they they try to be almost more real than the real thing. Yeah, and or if they they just present um, perhaps. Uh, especially true if it's just one image see our, our world is a moving dynamic world um, but if it's just a, a highly detailed a single image often it's uh, a lot of people argue that this is this is kind of dangerous because it's it's almost announcing proclaiming that this is how it was mm. yeah you're making a statement on things so uh, it's important to have a lot of wriggle room when, yeah. when you're trying to visualize a past about which there are a lot of uncertainties yeah. well speaking of uncertainties and and the sources of of history that you've used to create these simulations we mentioned him before but one of the most uh important people we have to inform our picture of uh angkor is uh joe daguan yeah yeah now depending on when i release this episode either before or after the angkor part two our listeners may not be aware of who this guy was and why he is so important to the historical study of this period. So let's assume they don't. Uh, Tom, can you tell us who Zhao was and why this guy is so crucial to your work? Sure. Um, Zhou de Guan or Zhao de Guan, um, he was a, a Chinese diplomat who visited Angkor in 1296 until 1297. So what's Angkor uh, sort of looking like at, at, in, in that, that period? Well, it's not 
it's not obviously in decline. Okay. Although Zhou De Guan mentions there are constant wars with the Siamese that mm-hmm. he hears about and that much of the countryside is in ruin. But when Zhou De Guan went there, it was very much a thriving metropolis. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he he um, evokes the, the phrase that he hears um, many Chinese uh, sailors have used that they call Cambodia rich and noble. And that is, it seems to be extremely rich that there's gold everywhere there's um uh Zhao De Guan, he talks a lot about the um the officials he sees um their adornments the the goods that are at angkor he's very impressed with the size and scale of the temples quite likely he was staying not far from the royal palace inside angkor tom and mm-hmm. probably in because he was a chinese envoy or diplomat he was staying with a a Chinese community there, okay. uh, you know, and possibly possibly hosted by uh, in, in, by their household. But um, so, what what is most valuable about his account is the only eyewitness account of Angkor. Oh, there I should is, mention yeah. that we uh, Zhou jo, jo stayed in uh, Angkor for a year, about a year, and, and then the, he he wrote a book about his stay. That's right. He he um so he he stayed there for about a year, and he wrote the book, I think, much later. Or people think, you know, when he, after he returned back to China, he wrote his, his memoirs of, mm-hmm. his, of, of what he saw there. And it's, it's um, many people believe that uh, the, the chapters we have, some of which are very brief, when we talk about a chapter of his memoir, it might just be a paragraph. It might, it might only be a um, hundred words. Some are longer, some are a couple of pages, three, four pages. Um, but many of the chapters are probably missing entirely they just weren't transcribed yeah uh, regularly they 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 were there when he wrote them but they've been lost maybe some of them exist somewhere in some archive uh, which would be fascinating if we could dig some of these up yeah. so but the value of his observations is that for me in particular they're very visual Zhao describes colors especially yeah. he describes um, very small details of you know, even these these palanquins that um, people were carried around in, almost like um, they're almost like litters or like a like a hammock, kind of suspended from a pole, carried by two people with someone important sitting in the hammock. Um, he um, des- he describes all the goods in the market. He describes. Um, uh, the the relationships between um, the the people there. He he had a very good. He he went. He saw the palace. He saw the king. He saw the king out in procession. Um, he gives us yeah you know, to, to work with as an animator. Be, some of these things are extremely valuable. He mm-hmm. describes the people as well. You know what they look like. A, a lot of the value of Zhao Deguan's eyewitness account is that the the inscriptions you get at Angkor, of, of which there are quite. There, there are many. These are written in stone, and often mm. they're installed at the temples. Um, they're pretty dry. They don't. They, they and um, some of them could be construed as propaganda. I yeah. mean, they, they they paint everything in the most positive light possible for the person who commissioned the writing. Um, some are useful in terms of what they're uh, describing uh, in in the goods that were donated to the temple and. Uh, how things were kind of managed, but sort of like uh, someone's tax return or that, something. That's like right. That. So yes. You can get a lot of information yep. from a tax return, but yes. if you wanted to know how that person felt, yeah, what or they were wearing, like a tax return or an obituary, almost. Yeah. yeah. So, but they're not eyewitness accounts. They don't really go into the the detail of of how people live their lives, mm. and and certainly they they're not. Um, they're, there's a, a large segment of the population is, is kind of written out. Or it, it, these are really inscriptions uh, commissioned by the elite and often about the elite. Mm. And they, they'll list people on, you know, villages are mentioned, but often in kind of lists of people attached to the temple. And so there was a whole lot of writing at Angkor. There was uh, undoubtedly, you know, libraries in the temple where texts were kept on palm leaf scrolls. And Zhao yeah. Duan describes these. Uh, he describes people writing on on deer skin he describes them writing on on again palm leaf with a stylus there, there's a whole lot of writing going on there but that that's all it's lost to us yeah, like the all, wooden houses all these that's it it's all gone. perished and it wasn't yeah. it, it, 
if it was copied down, it wasn't recopied, yeah. um, and it, it's gone. So what, what remains is the writing in stone, which we're fortunate to have. And then there's Zhao de Guan's account. Well, one of the most prominent scholars of Cambodian history, uh, actually your father, who you mentioned yeah. before, uh, he wrote something along the lines that you know, Zhao de Guan's account, it, it's provided historians with a kind of home video of his travels in Angkor. There's some quite lurid details that you yep. might expect someone's weird uncle to include when they've come back from Spain or something like that. It, it's a home video as opposed to a uh, feature-length documentary. And that's what sure. your, your, your dad kind of... Uh, he, he wishes that we had that feature-length documentary. It's kind of like trying to base your ideas of, of a country on someone's Instagram account of that country. So what, what would you say are some of the, the, the pitfalls of, of using um, this, this account, that like having this uh, be such an important part of the scholarship on Angkor? What are some of the problems that you've encountered using uh, the, the customs of Cambodia, which sure. is, which is um, that book he wrote? Yes, I get, well, I mean, there's, you have to be aware of, I guess, who Zhao is and who he's writing for. And he sounds like one of those um, British Victorian travellers travelling through the colonies and kind of often disdainful of the natives he sees yeah. there and their, their practices and you know, in equal measures you know, impressed by some things and kind of uh, disgusted or um, appalled by others. Mm. So, and where, you know, Zhao might be getting some of his, some of his information, he might have been getting it second hand. Mm. So, because um, there's a lot of people travelling from China to, to Cambodia, trading and things like that. Would he be getting sort of pub stories from some yeah, of these guys? Possibly while he was there, he could yeah. be. But, um, I mean, not all of it, but you, you can get hints of that. Mm. That, um, you know, he, I, he is often, he, he's often honest. He says, you know, I, you know, I've heard such and such, yeah. but uh, I do not know the truth of these, or I couldn't follow this up in more detail. Okay. So he, he's often reporting what he remembers. You're getting back to what it is to um, extend his home video account into a documentary. We've found a, one thing I've, I've realized with the adventure of visualizing things is we can take just a couple of sentences from Zhao de Guan's account and that might take us months to deal with Yeah. in an animation. Yeah. So it's almost, um, it's, 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 it's almost the other way around. We've got this quite brief account which again has some chapters only have just a just a paragraph in them but we can take one of these sentences and we have to choose our excerpts carefully and we try to animate a scene that goes with that excerpt so it can appear on the bottom of the screen like subtitles and we just find so many things just arise out of that so and it, and we have a little bit of freedom as you know to you know where we would place that scene um, that Zhao Guan describes so one thing we found was really difficult was trying to create a market that Zhao de Guan describes he describes market at Angkor well where exactly was the market but he's sure he describes how they lay out their goods uh, on the ground but you know when you get into visualization you have to think well was there anything else behind it? Was there stalls? Who was at the market? Was it... And Jean de Grand does describe... So he, get, he gives you enough to kind of get you going. But then you find once you start making it, there's so much more that you have to ask about. Yeah. And for instance, he describes the palace. Um, and the palace, the, the ruins of the palace are still there. A lot, of, a lot of people go visit it. And he gives a pretty good description of, you know, the, the colour of the, the tiles, the roof. Um, um, on the on the main building and some of the subsidiary building, he talks about uh, the king's audience hall, all of these things. And then you go to the palace, you walk around it, and you start to get a sense. Oh, yeah, this could be done. And then you you sit down with a team of modelers to start modeling it. And soon, very soon, you realize um, that you, you you're at a impasse. You don't know exactly which way a building's facing. You don't even know if a building was there. You don't. Um, there, there's all these things that mm. pop up. Um, so you can remedy this by kind of pulling the virtual camera further away and showing less of the palace and suggesting more or hiding it behind trees. And this is these are devices you have to use. Getting back to Zhao Duan's account, I mean, depending on what little excerpts you pick, 
small sentences become just whole universes, visual models. I mean, yeah. It's really amazing. I'm becoming increasingly aware of how um, generous you've been with your time already. Um, Tom, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, I can't thank you enough. Um, do you, is there any kind of uh, websites or, or social media that you would direct people to if they wanted to know more about the virtual and corporate Sure. The, the, um, the websites can be a bit uh, convoluted, um, but uh, there's the... Uh, I mean, the URLs can be a bit convoluted, but there's mm. a Google Arts and Culture page, which will be up soon. And there's also a website I've developed with my colleagues here in the history department at Monash, which is called virtualancor.com. And oh, that, that's I'll, really yeah, a I'll leave a link website. to that yeah. uh, website on my website as well, because Thanks, I can Lockie, sort of yeah. crib off some of the, yeah. the information you've put there, because it's uh, truly fascinating sure. and informative. And a lot of the stuff's not... I mean, a lot of the stuff still is on the university computers and hard drives, as mm. we, you know, we're still testing it and refining it, so... That'll come online gradually. Brilliant. Well, I'm sure people will be aware of it because it is amazing work. Um, Thanks, Lucky. All right. Great to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. It's been a pleasure. Really. Thank you very much. Thanks.